Good morning, everyone. If you are watching this, it means that we have canceled in-person services today because it is so cold and snowy out. So happy Valentine's Day. Just a quick reminder, uh, if you're watching us online or on the app, be sure to fill out our Connect card. That way we can pray for you and just know that you're out there and say hello. And also, this coming Wednesday, we have our Ash Wednesday services coming up, and that is at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. If you haven't experienced Ash Wednesday before, I would really encourage you to come on out. Either you can do it before work or after work. They're, both services are identical. They're 30 minutes long. It'll be a great experience, so we hope to see you there. So this morning, we're kicking off our new series, What the Health? What the Health? Yep. And uh, we're talking about what is health, and we live in this health-obsessed culture that is constantly trying to figure out what is healthy, and often we get these conflicting messages, right? Like, oh, you're supposed to do low-intensity workouts, or no, you're supposed to do high-intensity workouts, or you're supposed to, like, lift as heavy as you can, or lift as slow as you possibly can, and do lots of cardio, or don't do lots of cardio, and there's even now this craze of doing yoga with animals, like goats, and all of these things. We're trying to constantly improve ourselves, but anyone who's ever been caught up in this health movement, know that in the end, it can start to feel really hopeless, and you can feel really helpless because you exert all this energy, and you go down one path, or you go down another, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, but in the end, you're still left feeling kind of empty, you know, that you're constantly trying to improve yourself, but it never seems to fill that emptiness up, and the reason why is because our culture is reacting to the symptoms of unhealth, but not really dealing with the root of unhealth, because there's a deeper problem, despite all the, the unhealthy things we may do or live out, there's a deeper problem at the root of it, and that's what we call sin in the Christian tradition. And, and sin is this reality that the world is broken, and our bodies don't work the way that they fully should, that we age and we die, uh, that there's pollution, that, that things just don't work the way they should. It's the fact that things are kind of a mess. In fact, Francis Spuford, he says, sin is the human propensity to make a mess of things, and this is how he defines it. He says, it's our active inclination to break stuff. Stuff here, including moods, promises, relationships we care about, and, and our own well-being, and other people's well, well-being as well, uh, material objects, uh, whose high gloss positively seems to invite a big, fat scratch. And here's the reality. There is no thorough list of sins because humans are incredibly creative. We can turn just about anything into a sin, but the Christian tradition has put together a, a compilation of what we'd say are our inclinations to sin. And it's what, call, what they're called the, the seven deadly sins, as categories of sins, and it's lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. And this isn't a list found in the, in the Bible, but it's our, our Christian tradition has observed people's inclination to sin. But if we look at that list, what's interesting is they're all pretty ordinary things. Like we don't see murder or adultery or theft on there. They're, they're, those feel like the big deadly sins, but these, these are much more ordinary sins. And they're actually what are known as vices. And a vice is when we take a God-given gift, what we would call a virtue, and it gets distorted, and it gets turned into something that isn't so good and isn't what God intended. Rebecca DeYoung says this, vice happens when our pursuit of these good things gets twisted. That is, when we try to make them fill gaps and needs in our hearts that only God can fill. And when we define happiness in terms of them, rather than appreciating them as finite blessings from God. And one way to think about sin is it's kind of like a virus. You know, when we're talking about health, and we've been living in the midst of this terrible virus, but the reality is a virus is not a living being in and of itself. A virus is so minuscule, and it has to find a host, and it infects a cell, the cell that's meant to produce life in your body, and life giving processes in your body, it comes in and it hijacks it, and it repurposes the cell to create more virus. So it takes something that is life-giving and good and twists it and distorts it into doing something that makes you sick. And that's a great way to think about sin. It's not like sin is this entity that's floating around that you have to watch out for. It's that sin 
it is something that it takes a good inclination, a good gift, and it twists it, and it distorts it, and it makes it selfish and self-satisfying and self-gratifying, but it also makes it destructive. And so sin, it's how it plays out in our lives, but ultimately these are habits of the heart. Sin starts in the heart, and it works itself out in outward behavior. And so what we want to do is get at the root of this. And so we're going to take a deep dive into each one of these seven deadly sins. And to start out with a bang, we're going to start with lust. And what more appropriate topic than on Valentine's Day? So lust. The, with, each, with each deadly sin, there's a, there's a virtue that gets distorted. And the virtue that gets distorted with lust is love. You know, and love is this God-given, beautiful thing that's meant to enhance our life. And lust takes that and twists it. And here's the deal. Our culture really doesn't know how to distinguish between lust and love. If we look at the messages that are meant to be love songs, often they're not, they're not quite so great. In fact, if someone were to say some of these lines to you, you might feel kind of icky. Like, here's, here's, some, here's some lines from some popular songs. Uh, Ed Sheeran, I'm in love with the shape of you. I think if someone were to say that to you, you'd be like, what? That, that doesn't feel great. Or how about um, the way you flip your hair gets me overwhelmed. Or uh, break up with your girlfriend because I'm bored. How about you're the one I want to want me, right? It's not like you're the one I want. I want you to want me. Or uh, I promised you'll never find another like me. Or even this, I'll follow you through the dark, I can't get enough. And you think, if you're following, someone's following you through the dark because they can't get enough of you, that's like stalking, right? That's weird. But lest we think it's just a modern problem, you know, a generational problem, here's some, here's some older songs too. Elvis Presley, love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfill. Or the Righteous Brothers, oh my love, my darling, I've hungered for your touch a long, lonely time. Or lastly, Frankie Valley, you're too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off of you. You'd be like heaven to touch. I want to hold you so much. And again, we sing these songs and they seem like they're lovely, beautiful love songs. But when you actually break it down and think someone tells you, you're never going to find another like me. Or I just, I just can't wait to touch you. You think some of that sounds really creepy. Because what we've done is we've, we've taken these, these sentiments and they're much more about me and my own pleasure, and my own self-gratification, and I want you to want me, or I want you to satisfy me, because love is about mutuality. It's about respect. It's self-giving. You don't love someone because of what they do for you. You love someone for what, who they are and what you can do for them. You want to serve them. That's the nature of love. But lust takes that virtue, and it distorts it. And lust is about about um, pleasure seeking, and it's self-indulgent, and it ultimately, at its core, it's destructive because it takes others and it makes them an object for my own self-gratification. So love sees the other person and values the other person, but lust sees the other person's value as what they can do for me, and, what, and, and they're an object to be consumed. James Bryan Smith defines love lust like this. Lust is a false and short-lived pleasure that ultimately harms life. It feels good in the short term. It fills us up and satisfies in the short term. But in the end, it harms life. And Rebecca DeYoung says this, Lust pretends sex and sexual pleasure are a party for one. Lust makes sexual pleasure all about me. It is a self-gratification project. And so it's this excessive desire for our own pleasure. And, you know, many of us sitting here would think, well, you know, this is great, but I haven't committed the sin of lust. Like, this isn't really for me, because we think lust is a physical act. But just like we'd say, you know, our society is dealing with the symptoms of unhealth, but not the root of unhealth. Yes, lust can be a physical act, but it starts as a craving in the heart. That's where it begins. And and it originates in the heart, and ultimately, it's something we're all guilty of. Because Jesus, in his most famous sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount, he tackles all sorts of uncomfortable issues. It makes us all rethink how, how we live and how we consider ourselves and, and one another. And he has some really poignant words to say around lust. And this is what he says. 
You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Okay, so let's unpack that because what Jesus says there seems really extreme, you know, where he's talking about cutting off body parts and he seems to raise the bar. And the first thing to know is that Jesus is quoting the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law was given to Israel and it was the standard of which they were supposed to live. They were supposed to be a nation that stood apart from all other nations, that the way they lived would reveal the heart of God. And adultery is a big deal in in the Ten Commandments. It's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And, and the Mosaic Law has some really severe things to say about it. In fact, it says, if a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man and the woman who have committed adultery must be put to death. And it also says, if a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. In this way, you will purge Israel of such evil. And so, the Mosaic Law took adultery very seriously, but Jesus comes along and he says, you've heard it said, you know the teaching about adultery, but I say to you, and this is a really big deal, because what Jesus is doing is saying, you know the law, but I'm telling you something even more. He's claiming authority over the Mosaic Law. It would kind of be like this morning if I said, well, you know the Bible says this, but I say to do this. We were, you, you should rightfully be like, wait a second, who are you to say that we should do something different or further or other than the Bible? And so who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is God. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is, is the one who they were meant to reflect with the law. And so Jesus comes along and he says, I'm not just concerned with the letter of the law. You're kind of missing the point if you just stop at the letter of the law. I am concerned with the spirit of the law, not just the what, but the why. And so he is claiming a greater authority than the Mosaic law. He's reframing it, and he seems to set this really high bar. And he says it's not just enough not to have sex with someone else. Like that's that's a great start starting place, but that's not enough. The the bar is so much higher, and we have to start to ask, well. If I'm attracted to someone, does that mean that I've sinned? Like, am I supposed to start cutting off body parts and gouging out eyes? Like, what, what is Jesus getting at here? What, what does he mean? So let's take a, a deeper dive. Because the word that Jesus uses for lust, the Greek word is epithemia. Epithemia. And it means to covet. It means to a studied look with sexual intent. It's to look at someone with sexual arousal in mind. Right? And so James Bryan Smith, he describes it well. He says, epithemia is not referring to the first look, but the second. The first look may be simple attraction, but the second look is leering. Lust does not value the person, but mere body parts. Epithemia goes beyond mere sexual attraction. It intentionally cultivates sexual desire for the sake of the feeling itself. It is the opposite of love. Love looks into the eyes Epithemia steals glances below them. Love values the other as a person. Epithemia degrades the other. And so Jesus, when he talks about lust, he's not talking about mere attraction or even arousal. Because we have to remember, we are created by God. We are created by design for purpose. And human sexuality is not an accident. It is part of of the design. So attraction and arousal are not bad things. They're a starting point for the deeper purpose, which is connection and intimacy. That's really what all of that is meant to move us towards. You know, that God has a divine plan and all of that, you know, sexual sexual intimacy is meant to be done in the context of a covenant relationship. You know, a covenant relationship often known as marriage, right? And and that's Culturally, for us, that is our covenant relationship. There are other places and times where marriage wasn't possible, but covenant relationship was, because a covenant relationship is a vow, is a deeper commitment to one another. And so, epithemia, lust, 
is about seeking out arousal, right? Attraction and arousal are necessary for connection to, to ultimately lead us to God's divine purpose, which is to be in a covenant relationship. Lust isn't about com- connection and commitment and intimacy. Lust is about arousal. That's what it's about. It's looking in order to lust. It's looking that can lead to lust. And ultimately, it objectifies the other person. And so lust is this distortion of a natural God-given impulse. And here's the reality. Lust doesn't start in the bedroom. Lust starts as a craving of the heart. Lust doesn't start in the bedroom. Lust starts as a craving of the heart. And Jesus goes into detail about how very serious this problem is. He says, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And he doesn't just talk about your eye and your hand. He says your right eye and your right hand, which would have been your dominant hand, your stronger hand. And and what he's because they believe that the right side was your your stronger, more powerful side of your body. And so this would be a very severe loss. I mean, this is not a small thing. And to put it into context, in Jesus' time, people believed that sin resided in a body part. That's why you know, they would cut off the hand of a thief, because they believed that the sin resided in that part of the body. And, and, but notice this. Jesus doesn't say that someone else should gouge out your eye or someone else should cut off your hand. He says, you should do this to yourself. He's saying, he's talking about self-examination to weigh how very serious this heart issue is, the damage that it does. He says, it is better for you to lose a crucial body part than it is to continue to live this way. And he actually says, it's better for you to do this than to be thrown into hell. But that word there, hell, actually is Gehenna. And it refers to a physical place. Gehenna was this trash pit on the outside of the city where like they burned trash and bodies and it was just disgusting. It was this awful place. And Jesus says, if you let lust fester in your life, it's like throwing your whole life into the trash pit. It's like rotting your whole life away. It is better to purge that from your life. It is that damaging to the soul. And so because lust causes us to fall away from God. And when he talks about the eye and he talks about the hand, one way that we can think about this is that the eye is the impulse to lust, and the hand is the act of lust, when we act on that impulse. And so I want to explore the ways that we fall victim to the impact, the impulse of lust first. Because again, many of us are sitting here thinking, oh, that might not be me, but by the end of this, we're all going to realize we all have a bit of a lust problem. So the impulse of lust involves images desires and expectations that fill your mind and ultimately feed your heart. And this is what we would call pornography. And now I know there are some of you thinking, I don't have a pornography problem. And, you know, you might not have a visual pornography problem, but pornography is much bigger than just it, just illicit images. So that, that is part of it. That is part of it. But it's more than that. It's material that causes us to lust. It leads to selfish and self-gratifying desires and urges. And there are three kinds of pornography that cause this impulse of lust. And the first is visual pornography. And that is what we're most familiar with when we use that term. And it's a major problem here in America. And mainly, it's this problem because there's this lie about this impulse of lust, about visual, visual pornography, that no one gets hurt. No one gets hurt. It's just fantasy, right? It's just this world of, of fantasy. And, and if you look at our culture, the way that we've talked about pornography, it, it almost seems like it's a natural and normal thing to do. It's just something that, that is accepted across our culture. You know, that TV shows, movies, they make light of visual pornography. But that's a lie that no one gets hurt. It's not just about a fantasy world. In fact, uh, the first person who gets hurt from visual pornography is the user themselves, the person who is engaging in that act. Uh, Over 35 neuroscience-based studies reveal that pornography addiction is real. It's a real addiction. It creates a cycle of diminishing pleasure, meaning that what seems normal, what's 
deemed as normal sexual activity is no longer pleasurable, it's no longer satisfying, and so that leads uh, to lower sexual and relational satisfaction for the person who is addicted to pornography, and it distorts your view of sex, love, and relationships. So it, it harms your ability to connect with others. It lowers the, the satisfaction that you would have in a normal, healthy sexual relationship. Frederick Buechner says this, at its root, the hunger to know someone sexually is a hunger to know and be known by that person humanly. Food without nourishment doesn't fill the, fill the bill for long. Neither does sex without humanness. See, visual pornography removes the humanness and the humanity from sex. And ultimately, it leaves us empty and dissatisfied. But it doesn't just stop at hurting the user. It also hurts the 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 people that you're in relationship with, right? It, it spirals out. And so regular pornography users are more critical of their partners. Pornography has been shown to increase marital infidelity by over 300%. And ultimately, it's a violation of an intimate relationship. You are inviting someone else into an intimate relationship without, without the knowledge or permission of another person, right? You are violating the intimacy of the person that you're in relationship with. But lastly, first it hurts the user, hurts the people that you're in relationship with, but it also hurts those who are on the other end. The porn industry has been linked to sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Over 88% of scenes depict violence of some kind, and ultimately it robs that other person of their humanity. And sometimes we need to be reminded of this. You know, we'll often talk about you know, she's someone's daughter or sister or mother or friend, but the reality is we just need to remember she's someone. That's a person, and when we turn to visual pornography, we are, we are dehumanizing the person on the other end, and we turn them into an object for my own self-gratification. It reduces people. And men and women both struggle with visual pornography, men to a greater degree, uh, but women do as well. Uh, but it's not the most obvious way that we, in, it's, it's the most obvious way that we indulge in lust that we can see culturally, but there's more ways than that. There's more ways than that. And, and so the second type of pornography that, again, many of us would say, I don't, I've never looked at visual pornography, I don't struggle with it, I don't have a desire to that. But the second kind is emotional pornography. Because remember, pornography is what we are, the, it's the media, the images that we're filling our minds with which ultimately fill our hearts. And so many women let themselves off the hook because we don't struggle with visual pornography, but emotional pornography is just as damage, damaging. Emo it's the things that, that our emotional pornography are romance novels, romantic comedies, you know, TV shows like The Bachelorette, and, and these things, again, sin is not a living thing in and of itself. These aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but what they do is they cause us to create an emotional fantasy world. You know, and this emotional fantasy world is for my own self-gratification and my own pleasure. And I begin to think that other people exist to make me feel a certain way. Just like visual pornography does that, emotional pornography does the exact same thing. You know, it, we seek emotional pleasure from an artificial source. Rather than connection and intimacy with the person, we go and we seek it out from some source that isn't ultimately real but begins to feed this emotional fantasy. And, and in the end, it's damaging to relationships because it creates these unrealistic expectations that other people exist to make my world and my life go a certain way, to make my emotions feel a certain way. And, and you know, we can begin to compare our partner with, with others are thinking they should have certain qualities because we see them in these films or we read them about, about these in these books. For example, my husband Steve and I have been married for 18 years and he is a great wise man. But you know, something that would make him so much better. You know, he's so great as it is. But you know, the man can't sing. He, he cannot sing. He thinks he can sing. He can't sing. Now, if he could sing like Michael Buble, my life would be so much better. If I woke up in the morning and had Michael Buble singing to me to start my day, I would be incredibly happy, right? And sure, that can be fun to think, wouldn't that be great if Steve could sing? But the reality is I can start to think, oh, I'm not satisfied 
this person isn't meeting this emotional need and expectation of mine. I've, I've created this unrealis unrealistic expectation that this partner is meant to fulfill my needs. And so I create this fantasy world. And so when you fill your mind with unrealistic romantic expectations, you feed your heart to be dissatisfied with your partner. When you fill your mind, I'm going to say that again, with unrealistic romantic expectations, you feed your heart to be dissatisfied with your partner. And this can lead to nitpicking and nagging, and also it can lead to a lack of commitment because we think no one ever measures up. You know, they start out here, but then they disappoint me, and they don't go over and above, and my life is not a romantic comedy, and I just don't, I, no one seems to fit the bill. And so it can lead us constantly dissatisfied and craving something else. And the third way, the third way we indulge in the impulse of lust is what I call attractional pornography. Attractional pornography. And this is when we desire others to lust after us. And so we can dress provocatively. Uh, we can post certain pictures or images. We use our body as a way to get to draw the lustful gaze. And we want people to look at us. And we long for that second glance to come our way. And this also dehumanizes the other person because not only are we the, the source of their lust now, cause, causing them to lust, but we are also, they are feeding our own desire of lust because they become a mirror to us to, for my own self-gratification and self-satisfaction. And we're not seeking intimacy in that way, then we're seeking admiration. I want people to look at me and be attracted to me and think that I am wonderful because that feeds my own desire. And all three forms of indulging in the impulse of lust have effects on our mind, our heart, and our soul. And ultimately, they break our relationships. They break our relationship with God, and they break our relationship with others. And we must be aware of this impulse to lust because if it's fed enough, if it goes unchecked, it can lead us down the act to the act of lust, where we, where we actually make a willful decision of it. We need to rid ourselves of the impulse. Jesus says, rid yourself of this impulse because it's not going to lead you anywhere good. And so Rick Warren says this, God made every one of us a sexual being, and that is good. Attraction and arousal are natural, spontaneous, God-given responses to physical beauty, while lust is a deliberate act of the will. And the impulse of lust, indulged long enough, can ultimately lead us, lead us to a deliberate act of lust, where we choose for ourselves. Where it's not just in our heart, but now, now it begins to show itself in our outward behavior. And all acts of lust are a violation of relationship. All acts of lust are a violation of relationship, because God's ultimate intention for intimacy and sexual activity are meant to be in a covenant relationship. A, a committed relationship. And, and this is, what, again, what we call legal marriage. It's a binding relationship. It's more than just signing a lease. Because many of us think, oh, we've signed a lease, we moved in together. It's kind of like we're married. You're not. You're not. If you're living together, you're not married. I hate to break it to you. But marriage is about a vow. It is about entwining your lives so completely that it is near impossible to separate and to separate it is painful. Jesus tells us this. You know, when we get into a covenant relationship, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. You know, that, that's the God-intended context for sexual intimacy and activity. Because we have to first acknowledge we didn't create sexual intimacy and activity. So we don't get to say what the highest standard is. God does. And James Bryan Smith has this really helpful triangle where down at the bottom we see, you know, there's relational commitment and there's physical intimacy. And the farther they are apart, you know, the, the, the less commitment we have, the less physical intimacy we have. And they move upwards. The deeper our commitment, the more our physical intimacy, culminating at the top, which is a covenant relationship. Again, that is God's intended context for sexual activity is that we are so relationally entwined and committed to one another that, this is, that that's where it's meant to be. That is in, and any sexual activity outside of that is not in line with God's 
designed and intended context. Any sexual activity outside, of contact, uh, outside the context of a covenant relationship is, is outside of God's intended design. And there are three ways that this shows up. You know, the first is outside of a covenant relationship. And this is when we engage in sexual activity outside of a committed covenant relationship, and we are, invi- we are violating God's intended design. And in our culture, consent has become our highest standard. That, that, and again, I, I, I'll tell you, that's a great starting place. We should absolutely start at consent. You know, that two adults agree, and that's good. That's a great starting place. But God has more for our sexual activity than that. that that's not God's standard. You know, Dallas Willard says this, the two main errors in the, hum- in the area of human sexuality are this. One, assuming that all sexual desire is good. And two, believing that all sexual desire is bad. And the church has done a great job of emphasizing the badness of sexual desire. And many people have reacted and responded to that to say, well, no, sexual desire isn't, isn't bad. God isn't angry about sexual desire. And that, that's a good thing for us to reclaim and to reframe for one another. But our culture has gone to the other extreme to say that all sexual desire is good. That as long as people are consenting, it's good because sex is natural and casual and it's fun and we should just be able to say what we want. And, and that it's, 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 not, it's not helpful. In the end, it's not helpful because the standards of the culture aren't God's standards. For example, I was watching a show not too long ago, and one of the characters had broken up with her boyfriend, and, you know, her friends were talking to her, and she started talking about having a one-night stand. And, you know, of course, being the person I am, I'm assuming that her friends are going to be like, no, 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 don't do that, because they act, and they react in shock, and then they start to go on, and they, they're shocked that she's never had a one-night stand. And so the whole episode is around helping this one character learn the rules of having a one-night stand, and they, they're committed to helping her do this. See, in our, in our culture, we think, as long as two people are willing, it's fine. It's good. But let me tell you, I've sat with many, many married couples, and I've never once had one married couple say, you know, I really wished that each of us had had more partners before we got married. I've never once had a couple say that. I've seen more and more couples regret decisions outside of the, the context of a covenant relationship. You know, casual sex is outside of God's design. Casual sex is outside of God's design. We didn't create sex. We don't get to say what the standard is. God tells us what the standard is. You know, intimacy that exceeds commitment is damaging. Even, and I know this is going to step on some toes, but even if you are living together, if you have not taken a vow before God to intertwine your lives, signing a lease is not a covenant relationship. And so if you are living together and engaging in sexual activity outside of taking that vow, then you are exceeding what God has designed. And you have to ask yourself, why have I not taken that that step? Is it because I want a big party? Well, okay, you can have a party at any time. If you are truly committed to this person, make that vow, plan your party. Right? But if you are engaged in sexual activity outside of a marriage, the reality is you're violating God's design and you're taking something that's not yours. Because at the root of it, it is selfish. It is, I want my sexual desires to be gratified before I'm willing to make this step of a commitment. It might feel like it's mutual, but in the end, if you haven't committed, you're taking something that's not yours. Because if that relationship ends before you make it to the altar, then you, then you have violated that person and God's intention for that person's life. So engaging in, in sexual activity without a covenant relationship is selfish and self-gratifying. You know, in the end, it's an act of lust. The second way that we see this violation of relationship is the viola- this you know, breaking down of relationship because of the act of lust is the violation of a covenant relationship. And this is when we engage in intimate behavior outside of our committed relationship. That I'm, if I am in a covenant relationship and I engage with the sexual behavior with someone outside of it, or I might not be in a covenant relationship, but I'm engaging in sexual intimacy with someone who is in a covenant relationship. This is what we would call adultery or having an affair. So either I'm violating my own marriage vow or I'm I'm participating with someone who's violating their marriage vow. And there's two ways this shows up. 
The first one is physical adultery. And this is the most obvious way, right? We can identify that. That's when you are engaging in any sexual activity outside of a marriage with someone who is married, right? Whether you're married or they're married. And it's, it's an obvious violation because you've committed to intimacy with this person. You know, when you take a marriage vow, you've closed the circle and said, this is it. It's the two of us. And so when you go outside of that or you participate with someone who is going outside of that, that's, that is adultery. That's physical adultery. But there's another way that this shows up, and it's a little bit harder to identify, but the violation is just as real, and that's emotional adultery. And you know, I've sat with many a person who has become emotionally connected to someone outside of their marriage, where they start to share and confide, and they start to lean on this person, and it might not cross a physical boundary, but in the end, it is still lust, because I am, I'm seeking my own self-satisfaction outside of my commitments, right? And so, and, and those who have to work through emotional affairs, it's much more difficult because the physical violation, I, I, I've had so many people say, I'd rather they had just slept with that person. It would just be so much easier because they didn't, tech, it doesn't feel like they, they went outside the, the, the commitment that we made, but they did all at the same time. It doesn't feel right because in the end, we're both, both ways we're looking to get our needs met. You're choosing your own personal satisfaction. It's self-gratifying behavior. And the third way that we see the act of lust show up is the breaking of covenant relationship. The breaking of covenant relationship. And this is most often ends in divorce. And right after Jesus says those really hard words about lust, Jesus says these really hard words about divorce. He says, you have heard the law say, a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her, her a written notice of divorce. But I say, again, Jesus reframing it, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So let me nuance this for just a moment, because I recognize there are people here today who have experienced divorce, who are either walking through divorce who ha- or who have, who have been divorced and remarried. And I know this is a sensitive topic, but you know, Jesus is saying marriage is God's intended context for intimate relationship. That, that is what is meant to happen. And, and it should not easily be broken. You know, and Jesus, when he's talking about, you have heard it said, he's re- again referring to the Mosaic law that a, a husband could divorce his wife for whatever he wanted, really. And this is what it said. Suppose a man marries a woman, and she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. And ultimately, a man could divorce a, his wife for anything that was displeasing. He didn't like her cooking. He wanted to marry someone else. You know, he got bored. Uh, she got old. You know, any of those things, he was within his rights with the Mosaic law, but Jesus ups the stakes. And he says, just because you end the relationship doesn't mean you end the commitment. It doesn't work that way. Because divorce creates a cycle of sin. It creates a cycle of adultery. Because he says, if, if you divorce this woman, the reality is she would not be able to support herself. You know, it's not like she could go get a job and a home. She would have to find another man to support her. She would have to remarry somehow. And so he's saying you create a cycle of sin and adultery because you force this person to now find another covenant relationship. And so your commitment doesn't end because of your relationship. That's not how God intended it. And so let me say a word here about divorce because I've walked through many, I've walked with many people through the breakdown of a relationship. And what I will say is, I've never met anyone who went into the context of a covenant relationship thinking, oh, it's probably going to end. You know, that when divorce happens, it is always tragic. It is always tragic. And it means that something has broken down so severely that sometimes it cannot be fixed. Because even though divorce is always tragic, sometimes it is also inevitable. Sometimes it's inevitable. Either because the there's a the other person is unwilling to continue. So it doesn't matter how much you want to stay married. If this person isn't willing to work on your marriage, there's nothing you can do. Sometimes it's because the marriage vow has been so thoroughly violated that it's, it's null, right? And Jesus talks about the standard of adultery being what ends a relationship, you know, but I've seen this again, and I want to say this, if you are married and you are in an abusive relationship, 
If someone is abusing you verbally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, that is a violation of your marriage vow. That is, that is, uh, you are free to get out of that relationship. And if that is your reality, please seek help. You know, God does not, never intends us to stay in an abusive relationship. That is not God's will, right? That, that, that is dehumanizing and is a violation. So sometimes divorce is, is tragic, but it's necessary. That the ending of a relationship is the only inevitable course because it has been so thoroughly violated. And so please know that I have all this in mind when I talk about divorce. But N.T. Wright says the source, you know, the cause of most divorce is lust and lies. You know, this idea of either it's the impulse of lust or the act of lust, and it's the lies that we tell ourselves and others, that this it erodes our relationship. And emotional lust can be just as eroding as physical lust. For example, I know a couple. They were married for quite a while. They had four kids. But the wife consistently indulged in emotional pornography, Romance novels, romance movies, television shows, and she was dissatisfied with her husband, and it led to this nagging and nitpicking and constant telling him he's not enough, he's not enough, he's not enough, and threatening to divorce him, to try to get him to be who she wanted him to be to feed her own desire. And after a few years of this, one day she said, fine, then if you don't, if you don't do this, then I'm going to divorce you. And he, and he just said, fine, and it was done, and he never turned back. And it broke their family, it broke their marriage, it, and, and we saw the cycle of, of brokenness just, just work its way out from that. You know, and so we, we need to be careful about this. Divorce is not something to be taken lightly. To break a relationship causes a break in, in more than just you. And so those of you who are in this, in this place of even thinking about breaking a covenant relationship, I want to talk to you about the 80-20 rule. And just those of us who are married, the 80-20 rule, meaning this, your spouse fill, fulfills about 80% of your needs, right? That, if you're in a good marriage, 80% of your needs are going to be filled. But there's going to be 20% that are unfulfilled, right? So like Steve is great. He can't sing, right? But suddenly someone comes along who can sing and is super spontaneous and really fun, and they offer me that 20% that's lacking for my marriage. And you start to think, oh, that 20% looks really good. And you jump on that 20%, right? Because that's often what an affair is, is someone comes along and offers you that 20% that, that feels like it's missing. And that's super fun until you realize I am now lacking 80% of my life. What I what I had I gave up the 80 to jump on the 20. And so the 20 is almost always about self-gratification. It's always that impulse to lust of someone's going to offer me something that's going to make me feel good, that's going to fill me up because really my partner isn't fulfilling that role. That's what they're meant to do is fill me up and and gratify me. And so we can we can give in to this false thinking this lustful thinking that others are intended to fill my needs and it leaves us empty and it leaves us breaking relationships. And so breaking a covenant relationship, it always leaves a trail of more broken relationship. It often becomes a generational sin. And so there are some of you here today that are on the brink of divorce, that have been considering divorce, that have been threatening divorce. And again, there are some relationships that are so violated that it's inevitable, tragic but inevitable. But I want you to stop and really think, is part of what's going on here is that I have indulged in the impulse of lust, that I've given myself over to physical, you know, visual pornography, emotional pornography, attractional pornography, that I have begun to think that this person exists to gratify my needs and they're not doing that. Because I want to caution you before you break a relationship, because it is expensive. It is expensive financially, and it is expensive relationally, and it is expensive emotionally and spiritually, to really stop and see our lust and lies at the center of what's breaking down my marriage. Okay, does everyone feel thoroughly bad about yourself at this point? Like, everyone's like, oh, man, I'm the worst. I have this terrible lust problem, and, and what do I do from here? And let's start with where you shouldn't go. And where you shouldn't go is shame. Shame is the language of sin. You know, we see shame. Shame is not present in the beginning of our story. If we go back to the Garden of Eden, shame shows up at the fall. 
And shame is, is the language of the enemy. Shame tries to say, you are not worthy. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. And shame, when we give into shame, we hide. We hide. And James Bryan Smith says this, too many people repeatedly try and fail to deal with lust through their their willpower and tearful prayers and find no genuine change. We cannot change our heart by changing our outer behavior alone. See, shame says you just need to change yourself. Just change yourself. And you can't change yourself, so you're not good enough. And see, you're just a failure, and it causes us to hide and become more vulnerable to the power of sin. Because shame condemns. That's what shame is there to do, condemn. And it says you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to measure up. But here's the reality. God never speaks to us in the voice of shame. God is not here to condemn you. But God is certainly here to convict you. You To convict you to say, what you are doing is not worthy of you. What you are doing is not a good way to live this precious gift of life that I've given you. What you are doing is hurting you and hurting others. And you are worthy of more. And you are capable of more. And I want more for you. Paul says it like this, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, what we call shame, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. You know, and so um, N.T. Wright, not N.T. Wright, um, sorry, I totally forgot who's that. Often you'll hear the, the truth will set you free, the truth will set you free, but it'll often make you miserable at first. That's, that's Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr says that. The truth will set you free, but it will make you miserable first. You know, and, and so secrecy, shame, hiding, self-loathing, all of that fuels lust. You know, when we listen to shame, it fuels us because we think there's, I, I'm, not, I'm not capable of changing. I'm not worthy of anything more. This is all I can do. And so what is the remedy? What is the remedy out of this? You know, and we have to go back to the virtue of love. C.S. Lewis says this, love is the great conqueror of lust. Because, see, we're designed to love. We're told that God is love, and we're created in the image of God, that we are created to, to love, to be known in love, to love others, to connect in this way. It's at the core of who we are. Love is the remedy. Lust is the God-given desire for love gone awry. You know, and the reality is, lust is easier than love. Because in lust, you're in control. You're in control. You get to decide what you look at, what you think, what you feel. But with love, it's far riskier. Because you're not in control. You're not in control if someone loves you back. Or someone responds the way that you want. You, you, you can't control if you will receive love. But we need to desire the greater thing. See, often we'll say, you know, oh, you're struggling with lust. Here's all the things you have to do. And there are wise things that you can do. But we need to have the greater desire. Rob Bell says it like this. If it's just me against lust, the odds are always against me. Whatever it is that has its hooks in you, you will never be free until you want more. It's not about getting rid of desire. It's about giving ourselves to a bigger and and more powerful desire. And the truth is, lust is just that attempt to fill up the emptiness that's in each of us. Because if we're really honest, there's something that feels empty and lacking. And so we find something that we can control that doesn't feel so vulnerable, and it fills that up. But in the end, it doesn't heal us. The remedy for lust, is love. And romantic love is great, but romantic love will not heal you. It will not heal you. It is God's love that will heal you. That's where we have to start. Again, Paul says this about God's love. When our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus' love is what completes us. He makes us new. And so, yeah, there are really smart actions you can take to to prevent acting on the impulse of lust, right? You can put computers in public areas. You can put, uh, you know, software on your computer that monitors what you watch. You can pay attention to the things that you consume, whether that's romantic novels or the types of TV shows 
or the types of movies. You can put up appropriate relational boundaries with others. All of those things are wise and smart things. They will not heal the impulse of lust. They will not heal the craving of your heart if you don't desire something bigger. Right? So yes, do wise things, but the reality is we can't overcome it by our own righteousness. We can't overcome it by our own willpower. We do need to take wise actions, but we need something deeper. And when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, what Paul says is he gives you the Holy Spirit. God comes and resides in you and changes you from the inside out. Just like lust doesn't start in the bedroom, it starts in the heart. Healing doesn't start out here, it starts in here. Yes, we need to change our outward behavior, but really we need the, the impulse of our heart to be healed. And I had a friend who experienced this. He had struggled with visual pornography most of his life. He was introduced to it very young by other grown-ups, and then he eventually came to know Jesus, but, and he was married, and he had kids, and he loved his wife, and he loved his kids, and he still struggled with visual pornography. And he didn't quite know how to break that chain. And another friend of his said, try prayer. And what he meant by that was not just pray harder. Because I know those of you who are struggling, especially with visual pornography, I am sure that you pray all the time to be delivered from that. But what he meant was don't just pray to stop, right? But each time you feel that impulse, recognize it. Recognize it and take it to God and pray about it and confess it. But then meditate on God's love for you. Fill the void with something bigger. That's, that's the remedy, is that we have to fill the void. So when we find ourselves giving ourselves over to an emotional fantasy world, rather than going down that rabbit hole, we need to stop and, and fill the void with the love that is already available to us in God. That Jesus has given us everything. You know, it's about filling it with a bigger desire, the real desire. And that's what real health looks like. That's how we overcome lust, not by trying harder, but by allowing ourselves to be consumed by the true virtue of love. And so how do we do that? Well, the first step, how do we, how are we filled with this love? The first step is to repent. And I've, I've said this a bunch of times, repent is to turn towards God. You know, we often think repent is to stop. Stop looking at visual pornography. Stop reading romance novels. Stop having a conversation with that person. Instead, it's to turn towards God and to acknowledge the presence of God in our lives that our life is not working on our own and we need something bigger than ourselves. That it's not my righteousness that can stop this. It's someone bigger than me. And the second step is to receive. You know, and, and you're not turning towards a God who's disappointed in you and who's ashamed of you or who's scandalized by anything that you've done. You're turning towards a God who loves you and accepts you and knows you and has the ability to heal you and fill you. You're turning towards a God who is, who is love. And so find passages about God's love and meditate on them. You'll put them everywhere. Fill yourself with the love that is extended to you in Jesus. And the third step is to rely. And that's to rely on the Holy Spirit that dwells inside you. That you don't have to do this on your own willpower. And that's what my friend learned is that as he kept coming to the Holy Spirit with it, and meditating on God's love, the impulse of lust began to lose its grip because he was filled with a greater desire. He didn't listen to the voice of shame that just would keep him sinking deeper into sin and more vulnerable to sin. He turned towards God and allowed himself to be filled, and he relied on the Holy Spirit to guide him in that experience. So ask God to strengthen you because God wants to set you free. God wants you to have life and life to its fullest. God wants a healthy life. And a healthy life is grounded in the love of Jesus. Loving relationships with, with God that sets the foundation for all other relationships. And so I want to close today with my favorite prayer in the Bible. Favorite prayer that just really helps us meditate and think on God's love. So would you pray with me? Paul says this, and when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. 
And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen.